talking a load and I was on mute. Um, welcome those who are joining. Um, so we've still got um, people coming in and we just just as we're waiting um, invitation to have your camera on. The one thing is that this is recorded. Um, so if you're not comfortable, you can have it off, but it's, it's really great to see people's faces. Um, the question, I'll, I'll put it back in the chat for, I mean, maybe I'll post it maybe one or two more times, um, just to hear where you're joining from and what made you want to attend this webinar. Um, so I'll give it one or two more minutes. Um, we're at 45 people. Um, so we've got Brussels, London. So Brussels, London, we got some uh, interesting mix of people. So um, from really London, of course, who are organizing this Circular Economy Week, um, and the MacArthur Foundation um, based in Brussels. Got um, Talas Perth, consultants in Perth, Australia. So um, this really is a global event. Um, Belfast, Northern Ireland from Invest. Uh, Amsterdam from Deloitte in the Netherlands. Um, another person from Amsterdam closing the loop. Um, so yeah, really, really great mix. Um, so um, I think we, we, we've got to a probably pretty good number and, and we've not got so long. So um, it's probably a good time to, to kick it off. Um, I will, um, in fact, you know what, I'll spotlight myself. Um, so um, yeah, keep, keep the messages going and the chat is a really great function. I mean, this is we, we did this in basic MS Teams because hopefully by now I, I think it's one of the more familiar platforms. Um, but really great to to be here. Um, so I will just give a, a quick introduction. Um, firstly, just to repeat the messages. Um, so we are recording this. The aim is to put this on um, YouTube. Um, so um, yeah, that that just to, to note that as as just so that we can we can share this more widely. Um, I mentioned having cameras on is encouraged if you feel comfortable to do so. It's really great to see people's faces. Um, we will have some time for, for questions as well. Um, feel free to put reflections in the chat. I think it really encourages debate and it, it gives us prompts. Um, then, um, yes, as, as you'll see, people are typing where they're coming from and you know what job they do. I think that's really nice just to, to get a vibe of the room. I think there's a good number of people come joining us from the UK, but also um, from Europe and indeed, as we've seen, um, all the way from Australia. Um, I think we had some registrations in India and, and further afield. So um, I will just give uh, a quick introduction myself. So um, let's get going. My name is uh, Tamir Chowdhury. So I work at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Um, so it's part of the University of Cambridge. Uh, I'm actually based in the Brussels office um, where we do a lot more on policy and advocacy. Um, so I've worked here for, for two years um, and previously I worked in the UK government. Um, so let's have a quick look at the agenda. Um, so I will be the one facilitating this, this, this discussion. Um, firstly, uh, we thought it would just be a great opportunity to open up on a little bit about policymaking in the EU, um, what is happening on circular economy. Um, so my colleague Christy, um, who's the senior research project manager for the task force, will um, present that. And then we have um, two fabulous speakers from our businesses within this task force, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, so we've got Anthony Abbotts, who's director of group public affairs and sustainability at Rockwell Group, and Jorgen Hansen um, from North Hydro as the corporate sustain uh, social responsibility manager. Um, we are in terms of just explaining who we are. Um, we are a part of the University of Cambridge um, and what our role is, particularly in this space, is partnering with businesses and government to develop leadership and solutions for a sustainable economy. Um, so looking at things like net zero, nature, societies, um, and that's our kind of wider remit. Now in the Brussels office, we have this thing called the CLG Europe, so Corporate Leaders Group Europe, which is bringing progressive businesses together to advocate on some of these issues. So um, particularly on EU policymaking, um, doing strategic communications to engage with the highest level of policy audiences. Um, our aim is to bring 
running a cross-sectoral basis. So like today we have different members from different um, sectors um, who tend to be at the sort of uh, most progressive end. Um, and we found that this is a really great group to show that across the whole sectors that there are people who really want to see and, and, and push the fore on the way that we approach sustainability. Um, now, this is convened uh, within this whole event is actually by the Materials and Products Task Force. So that's the Task Force for Climate Neutral and Circular Materials and Products. We launched this at COP um, in Glasgow in 2021, uh, particularly focusing on these issues around industrial decarbonisation. And what we found was that um, really focusing on circularity, which is a growing topic um, indeed for this week um, in um, Circular Economy Week London um, and also more widely afield, um, it's, it's a really important thing that has been growing in the policy making space, particularly in the EU, and we're seeing more policies um, that are wider spanning and more visionary, um, even if maybe we want that a bit faster, um, it is a growing area of interest. And so just to give a very quick um, message of, you know, why, why did we create this event? I mean, firstly, I think um, what we're seeing is um, a growing interest in circular economy. And so the aim of this event was really just to open up what is happening um, a little bit further afield. Um, of course, the blessing of doing this online is those of us based in Brussels can kind of share our, our experiences out here. And we've got businesses um, from different parts of Europe. And it's also to maybe introduce some of the what, what's going on in the EU. And I think even if from our perspective, things could be going faster, perhaps, the EU is actually doing a lot of interesting work here. And so for countries such as the United Kingdom or wherever outside, I think it's a really interesting test case to see what are these policies and, you know, what is the approach and, and, and what can we learn from that? Then, of course, um, by bringing these businesses and, and being able to hear from Anthony and, and Jorgen, uh, we can see why this is actually also a thing that is important for businesses. Um, I think businesses can sometimes get characterized as, you know, dragging feet on sustainability and, I think that that view does prevail sometimes, um, but it's not really true. Um, there are many businesses and we'll hear from them actually showing that seeing the importance of um, sustainability, seeing the opportunities and, and seeing why it's a really important thing. So um, that's my uh, wider sort of opening set piece. Um, just to reiterate um, for those that have just joined, we are recording this, really encouraged to put video on. Um, feel free to share where you're coming from in the chat um, and, and what brought you here. And as we go along, it will be great to get some questions um, and, and we can take it either from the chat or, or from, from video. But um, yeah, I won't spend too much longer because um, there are other speakers um, yet to come. So um, I will now move to, uh, oh, sorry, just to quickly introduce the, the, the Materials and Products Task Force that I, I mentioned. Um, so these are current members, a cross-section of different businesses from, you know, cement to um, chemicals to um, digital. Um, so just to, to give an idea of who's in the task force. So uh, first session will just be a little bit about the policy brief overview. And so for this, I'll pass to my colleague, Christina. Um, so over to you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Tammy. It's really, uh, really great to be here and hello, everyone. Uh, so in the next, if we can move to the next slide, so in the first um, couple of minutes of this webinar, uh, the aim is to provide you with an overview of the European policy framework for circular economy, uh, also showcasing it through some of the key files that are being um, negotiated at the moment. And then I will finish uh, the presentation uh, with how we as a task force are engaging with these uh, policy developments. So to start the overview of uh, how the European policy framework for circular economy looks like, I would start with the, with the European uh, Green Deal. So the European Green Deal is one of the six uh, headline ambitions under the current European Commission for the five-year period of 2019 till uh, 2024, so until next year. And really the key aim of the Green Deal is to transform the EU into a competitive, modern and resource efficient economy with having a focus on first uh, achieving climate neutrality by 2050 
then also um, ensuring that economic growth is uh, decoupled from resource use and on just transition, making sure that no person and no place is left behind. And in this framework of the European Green Deal, circular economy actually plays a really um, key role. Uh, as you can see also in this uh, in this um, figure that I shared, that mobilizing industry for a clean and circular economy is one of the key ambitions under the European Green Deal, which takes me uh, to the next slide. So within, uh, if we can move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, so within uh, the European Green Deal, uh, the so-called new circular economy action plan has been proposed. So it has been uh, proposed in March uh, 2020, and it's um, a really comprehensive uh, plan uh, that includes multiple legislative uh, proposals uh, towards how um, how we can move faster uh, and transition faster towards a circular economy uh, in the EU. In terms of the focus um, areas of the of the circular economy action plan, so it um, it really aims to ensure uh, that uh, sustainable products are the norm in the EU, and along that a really important element is on empowering also consumers and public buyers. So there is really a key emphasis on enabling um, consumers to make uh, sustainable uh, choices. In terms of uh, the sectorial focus of the uh, of the circular economy action plan, it focuses on sectors that, on the one hand, use the most resources, and on the other hand, the sectors which have the highest potential for circularity. So these sectors, to give a couple of examples, for instance, the ICT sector, uh, packaging, plastics. Uh, textiles, um, as well as construction, um, construction and, and building um, materials. So just to uh, give uh, give a flavor of, of what these uh, sectors include. So other another goal of the of the circular economy action plan is also to ensure uh, that uh, there is less waste. And uh, also, again, linking to the just transition element mentioned earlier, making sure that circular economy, it really works for the people, regions and cities and looking more internationally how uh, the EU can um, support and also lead global efforts on circular economy. So it's again, it's quite a complex package with lots of um, legislative proposals. So if we move to the, to the next slide uh, to illustrate, I will share some of the key files uh, that are really important on enhancing um, circular economy in the EU and also related to the uh, circular economy action plan. So the first file I would briefly introduce is the Eco Design for Sustainable uh, Products Regulation. Um, so as very closely linking to the goals um, we just discussed earlier, it aims to, um, on the one hand, reduce waste, and on the other hand, ensure that the, the products that are either sold in Europe or made in Europe are fit for um, a more circular, resource efficient and climate neutral economy. I think a really uh, interesting part of the so-called ESDR file is the proposal on the digital product passports. Uh, with the task force, we also had a publication on it um, last year, again, showcasing the business uh, perspective because uh, this so-called digital product passport, it can be a really interesting uh, tool, uh, really providing information about the environmental sustainability uh, of the of the product. Really closely linked to the ESPR, another interesting file and really important file uh, that's being negotiated now is the, sub the, the file on substantiating green claims. Uh, so this is really tackling the pressing issue of, of greenwashing. And as you can also see uh, on the on the slide, so there is a study uh, that highlights from 2020 that over 50% uh, uh, of the claims uh, examined, they were uh, vague and over 40% were not substantiated. So it's, I think it really shows um, the severity of the of the issue. So this 
legislation, it aims to reduce uh, greenwashing by requiring companies to substantiate uh, environmental claims about the products. Um, I brought some more examples, so we can, if we can move to the to the next uh, slide. So as uh, when when I talked about the circular economy action plan, I mentioned that it's focusing also uh, on specific uh, sectors, and uh, packaging is is one of them. So again, the packaging and packaging based uh, regulation is a really key file, uh, which aims to prevent uh, the production of packaging waste and also promoting the reuse of packaging, recycling, and also other forms of um, recovering, um, recovering packaging waste. And the fourth example that I brought today in terms of some of the some of the key policy files that, uh, that are now really in the focus is the so-called Critical Raw Materials Act or uh, as it's called, uh, the, the CRMA. Um, it's a really key file because critical raw materials are really uh, important uh, to, and there is a growing demand for them uh, to drive forward uh, the so-called green, um, green and, and digital twin transition. So this file that, uh, that was proposed earlier this year, it aims to ensure that the EU has access to secure and sustainable supply of critical raw materials. And also another reason that I highlighted it now uh, is having the lens of, of, of discussing circular economy uh, is because this, uh, this file uh, proposes benchmarks um, along the strategic raw material value chain. And one of these benchmarks that it proposes is an at least 15% uh, domestic recycling target for these materials. And with the task force, uh, we've been quite actively engaged on this file. So this will be one of the examples I share with you how we are engaging with this policy moment. Uh, again, this is just a snapshot of some of the files. Uh, of course, there is more uh, that's, being, uh, that's being negotiated and which are really important, for instance, around uh, right to repair, but again, it's just to uh, show also the the, the range and, and diversity uh, of the of the policy files that are uh, currently in discussions. If we can move to the next slide, um, so what's the future? Uh, what's the future outlook, and and what are some of the challenges that we uh, that we face when we talk about uh, circular economy in the EU, but also looking more globally. So the first element I would highlight is around the implementation of these policies and also the coherence between uh, between policies. So now we are in a really uh, interesting time as uh, we are moving towards the European elections in June 2024, and there will be also a new commission set up uh, by the autumn. So it will be really uh, interesting and important to see how the files that are already being negotiated, how they will be finalized and implemented. And another particularly important element will be around how coherent uh, these files will be and how we can maximize that, uh, maximize the synergies and the alignment between the different policies, uh, particularly the nexus between uh, circular economy climate, nature, and digitalization. Uh, if you look a bit uh, further, so I mentioned the upcoming EU elections, so it will be important to see how the legacy of the particularly of the circular economy action plan is, is featured in the next agenda and what the priorities uh, will be of the, of the next uh, institutions, particularly considering that we are in, we are living in a quiet, uh, rapidly shifting uh, geopolitical context, experiencing multiple crises. So what will be, um, you know, how really the role of circular economy will be featured in this new agenda. And last but not least, looking more to uh, more externally, international collaboration, of course, will be, will be really important, uh, particularly if we look at how we can incentivize industrial decarbonization, uh, by creating uh, demands and also how we can 
truly enable a global transition towards circular economy. Um, I would move us to the to the next slide. Um, so now, as I introduce like the overarching policy framework and some of the key files uh, in the EU, I would like to walk us through a bit how uh, the materials and products task force works in this um, in this policy context. Um, so we can see uh, that energy industry intensive industries they will really play a key role. Uh, in, in the transition towards um, more climate neutrality and more circular economy, as these industries, they are really responsible uh, for a significant portion of um, emissions in the EU, but both uh, globally. Therefore, speeding up the transition in these sectors will be really critical. Uh, what we saw parallel to this, uh, to this policy developments that I just shared is that uh, previously and, and more historically, energy intensive industries have been more dominated uh, by by negative uh, voices when discussing uh, these policies on on climate neutrality and uh, and climate. However, what we've seen and also working with our task force members is that there has been uh, definitely um, a positive shift over the past years and more and more industry players are understanding how important it is to address uh, the challenges and really scale up uh, the, the transformation towards uh, climate uh, neutrality. And with the task force, we really see that, uh, that more and more uh, businesses are also engaging in advocacy uh, towards increasing um, the, the ambition in the in the policies we have. Um, if we can move to the to the next slide. So Tamid already uh, already introduced the task force briefly, but this is really the the context in 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 which we work and how we work with uh, with ambitious and and leading businesses. And just to just to re reiterate, uh, what we aim to to do is to really drive uh, the development implementation and support of, of more ambitious and, and future proof policies to really ensure that we create ecosystems uh, that shift away more rapidly from energy and, and resource uh, intensive production of materials and, and products. So that's really the core of what we do with the, with the task force. Uh, here on this slide, I'm just sharing some uh, some pictures in terms of uh, that really shows the, the activities that we have. Uh, so we have regular publications, uh, for instance, policy briefings on specific topics. We convene um, high level uh, events. Um, and if we go to the next slide. Then I will uh, I would like to showcase uh, one concrete example of uh, of how we work with the with, with the task force and how we engage with, with European policy. So earlier I introduced uh, the Critical Raw Materials Act and the importance of it. Um, so following that the proposal was uh, was published in, in March earlier this year, in collaboration with the Wuppertal Institute, the task force produced a report titled Embracing Circularity, a pathway for strengthening the Critical Raw Materials Act. In this study, uh, we really looked at uh, and focused on what role and what the key role of circular economy could play in the EU's Critical Raw Materials Act. And working together with our task force members, but also other identified key uh, stakeholders and, and businesses, we draw on a diverse range of business perspective. And in this report, we looked at what we see as opportunities and challenges when we would like to implement more circular practices in the way we use um, critical raw materials. Um, I showed some pictures in the previous slide. So that was uh, team pictures that was from the report launch. So we had a really high level um, report launch in the European Parliament that was hosted by MEP Sarah uh, Mathieu who is uh, the, the shadow reporter on the uh, environment and we committee in the in the parliament um, on the on the file. So it was a really, really nice uh, event and we keep engaging 
uh, with this uh, with this file as it's being negotiated. And we have a short uh, video to show our engagement um, around um, around the report that I think would uh, would yeah give a give an example of of how we work with the task force. So I think I will wrap up this scene setting here, and then we have the video and and look forward to the discussion later. Mining can be a messy, controversial process. Yet we need these materials for the goods that we use every day. Could we imagine our lives without our phones or laptops? The European Commission introduced the Critical Raw Materials Act in March 2023, with the aim of diversifying where we get these materials from, including increasing domestic supply. One key solution is increasing our circularity. In other words, how we can use our materials in a more efficient and smarter way. It also means having the ability to reuse our materials when we are done with them. The Critical Raw Materials Act has a recycled content target of 15% by 2030. But circularity is far more than just recycling. In July, CLG Europe's Materials and Products Task Force launched our report. This report combines cutting edge research along with practical business examples the report demonstrates that far more can be done to make the most of the materials we dig up. I think what we see is that there's really a need of, a, of an urgency uh, in the sense that from Europe, when it comes to circular economy, of course, we've already taken some steps. Uh, but honestly, I think we need to show a lot more ambition. We don't have mines in Europe. Maybe we have a, a few mines in Europe. The importation of raw materials from third countries is very high and our dependency on strategic minerals is very high in Europe. My key takeaways are that the report points to three key policy initiatives that should be undertaken with urgency. The first of those is that we need to have a more joined up strategic approach to industrial strategy that links critical raw materials to the other climate and sustainability challenges. The second is that overall policy on this much needs to be much more coordinated and aligned so there are not perverse incentives. And the third is that we need to combine an overall strategy with a case by case approach so that each critical raw material has the right response within that overall framework. We need more of these materials, but there's only so much in the earth. I think the commission itself said that the lithium expectation for demand of lithium is going to go up by 13, 12, 13 times by 2030 and even higher by 2050. We, we can't do anything about that unless we use and reuse the materials we already have. And our report really demonstrates the, the ways that we can do that. It's uh, expectations from, uh, from our customers, our investors and our employees that we use the, uh, any resources in a responsible way. Uh, this uh, helps both reducing costs and the CO2 footprint of, uh, of our uh, production. In the automotive industry, as a business, we need to go beyond climate change. And if you look at the impact on biodiversity, if you look at the geopolitical context today, we are uh, doing business in and so on. Without circularity, we are not going to be a sustainable business in the long run. What I also heard uh, today is that a lot of businesses are already working on, uh, on these solutions that industry is really ready uh, to take it up, uh, but of course that they also need to have uh, the support and uh, the, the strategy uh, in that sense to make sure that we really create uh, the circular um, ecosystem and framework. Circularity will play a key role in the way we use critical raw materials. Our report demonstrates the tangible actions that can be taken now to ensure we create a green, circular European economy. If you would like to learn more, check out our report. So uh, thank you. Um, thank you to Christina. Um, and yeah, it was great to, to work on the report. Um, now, I mean, I think that's, we use that as an example of showcasing some of the work we've done, um, but but I think we can, we can talk about this more broadly. So um, I'll just take it back to the report, uh, to the uh, event. Uh, sorry, the presentation. Um, and maybe if there are any questions, we can go and, and take them in in the comments. But maybe we'll 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 loop back if there are any to Christine.
Tina. But my suggestion is that we move now to our business panel. Um, so it's really great to have um, some fabulous expertise across um, different borders. So we've got Anthony uh, Abbott, as, as I mentioned, from Rockwall, and Jorgen from North Kidro. So uh, I think we can spotlight them. Um, but I will start with Anthony and just um, I think what would be really helpful um, is just talking a little bit about, you know, as I say, the, where, where you're working from, where, where you work and um, yeah, your, your views, your business views on, on circularity and anything else you want to showcase. So over to you. Thanks, uh, Tamid. Um, and hi, everyone. So Rockwell, Danish company, uh, world's, world's largest uh, manufacturer of, of, of stonewall products. Um, a large majority of those stonewall products are being used in, in insulation, but also in, in other um, applications, um, both within the building environment and also outside uh, horticultural substrates, for example. Um, uh, close to 90% of our products are, are defined as or classified as, uh, uh, as taxonomy uh, eligible. Um, so products contributing to the to the green transition. Circularity, incredibly uh, important for us as a business. Why is that? Um, because it puts us in a good place when it comes to um, competing uh, uh, in the markets. Uh, so uh, we believe it's a competitive advantage for us. Um, but of course, uh, it's very much closely related to uh, driving a minimized uh, environmental footprint, not least from a resource consumption perspective, but also uh, from a decarbonization perspective, because there's a clear link between circularity and and decarbonization. Um, so there's a lot of good things when it comes to stonewall products that uh, relate to circularity, durability, average lifetime of 50 years, recycled content, typically an average recycled content is around 25%, and that's because we're able to utilize secondary raw materials. So uh, materials coming from other industries, which are replacing virgin stone. And then the fact that uh, our products uh, are endlessly uh, recyclable, um, and uh, I noted in the video uh, that circularity uh, is very much more than uh, recycling, which uh, we we totally uh, agree on. But my focus here is on on how we can drive uh, more recycling uh, in the um, in the construction industry because uh, we have we have an issue, and that is uh, that there are an enormous amount of waste coming from the construction and, and demolition uh, business uh, that is uh, that is ending up uh, in in landfill. Um, and if we don't address that, then we're not going to uh, address the uh, the scarcity of resource issue. We're not going to address the uh, the our ambition of getting to net zero in in 2050. Now, what are we trying to do as a company when it comes to recycling? Uh, one of the one of the things that we have done is set a goal uh, to offer take back systems. Um, in 30 countries by 2030. We're up to, to 19 countries uh, today. Um, and it's important for us, irrespective of whether there are conducive conditions in the respective markets for circularity, it's important for us to send the signal to the market that we can take the material back, whether it's from the construction site, from the renovation renovation site, or from, from the demolition site. But we're faced with a number of different challenges. Um, and uh, I'll just highlight two now. The first is price. Uh, we all know in the construction industry uh, that margins are tight. Uh, and at the end of the day, if we don't value the material as a valuable material, but rather as a waste, then there is a likelihood that it will be treated as a waste and uh, end up in landfill. Um, one of the big challenges we have at the moment is that uh, waste is not uh, valued, it's not given a significant 
cost, let's take landfill prices. If we start with the UK, uh, we're talking around 118 uh, British pounds, so around 137 euro per ton to send our material to landfill. If you compare that with Germany, we're talking about 400 to 700 uh, euro per ton. And if you go to Austria, then we're talking about 1,000 euro per ton. Clearly, there's a cost associated with bringing the material back uh, to our factories. Um, and if the landfill price is relatively low, then when our customers, contractors, um, uh, companies in the building industry have to make a decision on what to do with the material, then they're going to choose the cheapest uh, uh, solution. And that often is landfill. Now, if landfill prices are much higher, then suddenly our take back system becomes competitive and there's a greater likelihood uh, that uh, um, companies will choose uh, our solution. So that's one big issue. There are a number of other regulatory issues, but that's one that I'd like to focus on. That's uh, to, to a, quite a great extent outside our sphere of influence, although we're very active in advocating for uh, higher landfill prices and the banning of landfilling of recyclable products. That's happening, for example, in uh, Germany, where they're uh, introducing a ban on the landfilling of recyclable products uh, in 2024. Another challenge uh, is the um, the internal logistics or, or rather the reverse logistics. We are as a company experts in getting products out to market. We have less experience in getting material back from the market uh, and that requires a considerable amount of value chain collaboration um, and streamlining the process from the demolition sites, the renovation sites, the construction sites, streamlining the process of getting the material back uh, in a smart way, in a user friendly way and in a cost uh, effective way. Uh, and that's something that we uh, are working uh, a lot on together with our uh, partners in the value chain, uh, waste companies in, in particular. Um, uh, and there's still a lot, a long way to go there, but but uh, uh, good experience and, and good, uh, good cases in, in, in different countries. Maybe Tamid, I'll stop there um, and then um, uh, we can maybe pick up on uh, any questions uh, uh, afterwards. Yeah, uh, that, that sounds good. Uh, thanks a lot, Anthony. Um, yeah, really interesting. And I and always love actually hearing that the practical example, I think um, there's a, th th what you can find on Google is, you know, there's the reports on why circularity is important, but to, to really get that business aspect, um, and particularly for you, you know, this question of landfill being way cheaper in say the uk um which is very relevant for this conversation and and what that means as a business um so yeah that's for sure we can come back to that but uh i think it'll be a good time to pass over to jorgen so um over to you thanks sammy uh and hi everyone so uh, for those of you who don't know uh nos credo is a global aluminum and energy company uh, which gives us a fairly long value chain right from the mine through refinery, smelting, extrusions, and we also have a fairly prominent position in recycling or urban mining, if you if you like. So I just wanted to start by saying that I completely agree with uh, what you said uh, on the landfilling prices, because you know basically we can recycle anything; it just goes through the cost. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to focus a little bit on um, uh, on the aluminum, so I might have a vested interest here, so you have to forgive me, but uh, we regard aluminum and its value chain uh, as something that carries a range of, of properties that makes it a great showcase material for what the circular economy uh, could or should entail. Uh, the metal itself, uh, as you may or may not know, is it, it's durable, it's uh, corrosion resistant, uh, as opposed to steel, for example, it has a lightweight and uh, identical to, to Rockwell's product, it can be infinitely recycled at the end of its life with a fraction of the original energy consumption and without losing its uh, qualities. But having said that, it doesn't mean that the metal isn't without challenges, right? And it does carry a significant footprint, both from the social, environmental and environmental perspective as well. So 
if I try to break it down, and this is, I mean, circularity is really complicated, and I've been giving five minutes, so I have to take a few shortcuts, but to try to make it uh, as comprehensible or understandable as possible, we can split it into three main interlinked flows when we think about circularity in Hydro. So if we start with the upstream part, you know, that's the mine and typically the refinery and up to maybe smelters, like the first time you produce something or what we call primary metal. The key focus for us is primarily on reduction and reuse of the waste, because there will always be waste, right? You can uh, lower it and you can utilize it better than you have, but you know, any which way you tweak it, you will need to dig something out of the ground and you will need to refine it. The mid and downstream part, uh, there is uh, the recycling, uh, sorting and reuse thing, uh, which means we work to get back much more metal than we do today. And sort of like uh, a separate flow, but maybe also interlinked between them is the innovation for circularity, trying to develop products and solutions with our partners and downstream customers to better fit into the circular economy. And obviously these things are tied together, but if we try to, uh, or if I try to give you a few examples of how we think, if you start with the first one, the reduction part, we sort of coin that uh, waste to value uh, principle or approach, where we're closely examining, you know, and developing the business case for key waste streams to turn them into resources more so than we do today. For example, you know, bauxite residue, which is the waste generated in the early phases of producing aluminum or alumina, uh, can be reused in other industries. It can be reused with uh, cement or it can be reused with other types of uh, metal production. There's iron left there, which previously had just been, you know, put into uh, uh, waste dumps. But, you know, we see today with development of new technology and new demand, there is actually a business case if we can sort of break down a few barriers to at least extract more value out of it. And the mid and, and downstream part for us, the recycling and sorting, it's critical for us to secure access to what we call post-consumer uh, scrap or, you know, end of life scrap and strengthening uh, the sorting to avoid downgrading. Because even though aluminum is infinitely uh, recyclable, it will usually be contaminated. I mean, you don't get in your car, you have aluminum, but it's not pure. So when you recycle it, it's hard to do it in a way without it being too expensive, where you can reuse the metal as something sophisticated or highly valuable. So you end up in each cycle downgrading it, so to speak, because it's too hard to separate the alloys and the other metals from the aluminum. If we can think a little bit more holistic about that, we can design the cars differently, making it easier to recycle the aluminum and make it more flexible in terms of what you want to reuse it for, which is basically putting money in the bank. Um, and this sort of segues a little bit into that third, you know, slightly artificial pillar that I mentioned, you know, the innovation for circularity box, right? Where we have, uh, we, we look at the different products and solutions we have, and we start discussing with our customers and you know, also, you know, with uh, communities and, and authorities to see if we together can sort of establish a framework where it's, incentivizes all the different parties to do this differently, you know, for the net benefit of, of a circular economy. So, so that means, you know, designing out waste as much as possible, you know, simplifying and accommodating recycling, reuse, refurbishment. And like I mentioned with the automotive part or the car, the disassembly process, hmm? simply to try to promote, look at every bits and pieces of the, of the product, you know, how can we do this differently to make it easier when we want to sort of return the different bits and pieces in a, you know, also financially sound way. And just to pick up on, uh, on what you said on the, on the, on the construction part, um, one example that at least uh, cuts a little bit into this is, is uh, in our units, uh, business unit called building systems where we now have developed um, a standalone process for taking out the alumina or aluminum, which you will find typically in, in window frames and, and, and door frames and things like that. So prior to demolishing uh, the building, our people or our team will actually go in and remove all these window frames and the door systems where there is a lot of valuable aluminum rather than just taking everything down and then go through third parties who will mix it up and blend it, making the recycling process much more expensive for us. There's just one example about, you know, fairly low hanging fruit, but somebody has to think about it to, to make it, uh, make it fly. So again, 
we're in a at the, at the starting point of all of this, but we do see, and I just want to echo my previous speaker as well, that there is a lot of traction and people are interested, our customers at least, are interested in exploring these solutions. So even though it's a, it's a brief snippet, I just wanted to conclude that uh, we as a, as a fairly big industrial uh, company are trying to work across many dimensions. Commercially, yes, but obviously also in R&D, since we see that we need some technology advances to make some of these things more viable. And we will definitely continue to invest time and resources into that. And, and I think it's important that has to be done through partnerships. It could be with, you know, the authorities putting up the tax for landfill, for example, but it could also be not excluding the authorities, but importantly with customers who, you know, want to join us in trying to improve their own circular uh, uh, footprint. I think I'll just stop there. That hopefully gave you gave you an idea of how a big industrial business to business company uh, pretty far upstream is also trying to at least do a little bit more than what we used to do. Yeah, and no, I think thanks a lot, Jorgen. I mean, for me as well, <clears throat> what I really get when 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 I listen to you is, I mean, this point that we we use aluminium um, so much, and and so many of us, and and me included, uh, kind of take it for granted, and really understanding the the technicalities, and you know, the point you say about you know, uh, it can get contaminated, um, and actually having to think about that, and and bringing that in the wider climate debate, and also just resource practicalities um, is really fascinating and yeah you know the work you're doing and seeing where you can do it in different innovation I think it's I, I think it gives a lot of food for thought and I've, I've seen that you know um, you've already got some plaudits so um, uh, that's that's great um, for, from uh, both of you um, so um, I have a question that that came to me in my mind uh, I will I'll ask it but but in the meantime uh, we do have uh, a few minutes so if anyone does want to either share reflections or, or comments um, please do so. Um, but but the one sort of quite broad line question that uh, that comes to me, and I will also admit that it came to me a couple of years ago when I first heard businesses talking about you know sustainability, climate, circular economy, and it was just what, why are these businesses what why are the businesses advocating for things that could be bad for them? You know we've heard about landfill taxes. Um, say, I, I would imagine that maybe there's someone who's joined this call for the first time, and it's like, so, so why is the why is a business advocating for higher taxes? That just goes against the the logical thing of what I understand about businesses. So, if if someone were to, well, I am posing this question to to both of you. Um, yeah, maybe just a, some some short reflections on yeah, what why, how does that make sense to you? So shall I uh, give it a shot first, Jan, and then uh, you, you can you can answer the app. Yeah. So um, good question, Tamir. Um, so as a, as a company and a, as a business, we have been uh, utilising secondary raw materials uh, from the steel industry, from actually from also the aluminium industry for for decades. And why have we been doing that? Uh, because it makes uh, business sense. Um, it makes sense from a cost perspective. It also makes sense actually from an energy efficiency perspective because we're able to melt the stone and we're melting stone at 1500 degrees. We're, help, we're able to do that in a uh, more energy efficient way uh, by replacing the virgin stone with secondary raw material. So you could say that's been part of our uh, production process for for decades on top of that we have the durability and and clearly if we can say to our customers that uh, we can maintain the performance of our products for x amount of years uh, then that, that can give us a competitive advantage so we've had focus on that now the recycling is something that we've been able to do internally Again, it's given us an advantage both from an energy efficiency perspective, from a CO2 perspective, um, uh, and, and we have uh, continually focused on that. The, uh, the bringing the, the material back from the market, that's, that's relatively new uh, in a number of countries. We've been doing it in Denmark since the 90s and in Germany uh, since, uh, since 2000, but in a number of other countries relatively new. Why are we doing that? We're doing that uh, because we can see that it makes sense 
from a uh, operations perspective, but it also makes sense from a commercial perspective because our material uh, has an advantage compared to uh, competing materials. And then a second driver is, of course, the license to operate. Um, we have the example in Germany where they're going to uh, ban, landfill ban, recyclable products. We have uh, an example in France where they're introducing uh, a mandatory uh, extended pr producer responsibility scheme. Uh, so, of course, if we're positioned uh, well in advance to to meet these requirements, then again, commercially, that makes sense. Great, thank you. Over to you, Jorgen. Yeah, OK, so now I think it's important. I mean, in the perfect world, we wouldn't need any taxes or incentives, right? But I think we can agree that it's not perfect. Uh, so from a fairly sort of conceptual level, it doesn't really matter for Hydro, and I don't think it matters for Rockwell either, what the, you know, the taxes, I, I would actually maybe not call it tax, but maybe just true cost uh, of doing uh, or of running processes are, as long as there's a level playing field, right? I mean, that's the important part, and you really see it in a global economy. Because if we have to pay X for a landfill and everybody else has to pay X for a landfill, you know, then uh, the focus on efficiency and innovation will be distributed equally. And obviously putting a tax on something that is a netto negative or net negative for the world is one of many mechanisms you can use. And it works, right? Uh, like, like Anthony described, it's probably easier to recycle bits and pieces in Germany simply due to the fact that even Austria, uh, that it's economically viable. Right. There's there's money. There's money. Uh, p p there's a uh, financial possibility there. And I mean, I can just look at myself in Norway, um, where I when I'm not uh, living, staying in Brussels, I live in Norway. They just introduced the higher cost for the plastic bags you buy at the local grocery store. They used to be really cheap. Now they're like a euro or a little below a euro. And all of a sudden, the consumption of these plastic bags drops with, I don't know, 50 percent in two weeks. And I've been trying for years to get people to understand you shouldn't buy plastic bags. But once you put the tax on it, you can, you can accelerate the positive change you're looking for. So in terms of, of putting the, the infrastructure in place or sort of the blueprints to incite companies and consumers to think differently, I think it's tremendously important to, if you want an accelerated process at the very least, to put, you know, this is the actual cost of using the landfill, right? Because I, I have a sneaky suspicion that we're just pushing the cost in front of us, right? For the next generation, so to speak. I mean, if you look at your cell phone, uh, there's so many rare minerals in here. There's a lot of aluminum too, but it's not enough to make it uh, economically uh, possible to recycle the aluminum. In your bikes, for example, as well, there's lots of aluminum, but they all go to landfill, right? Because it's not enough aluminum to set up a process that makes uh, uh, a commercial player willing to invest the money in it, given the technology we have today. So I think, you know, taxes or, you know, incentive mechanisms serves a purpose. They will never be perfect. They're all always negative sides too. So we should be careful with introducing them. But we also see that just uh, simply relying on the benign nature of mankind hasn't really always led to the best uh, solutions, at least not uh, in a very fast. So, so you know, that's uh, more or less, at least uh, maybe not to the official view here uh, since it's recorded, but my personal opinion, I guess. Slight disclaimer there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and, and really, um, yeah, really interesting views both. Um, I'm noting time and there's a few questions that came in. Um, so I would just ask if you have any views. I mean, if you want to respond to any of the questions on the chat, would that be the most the best way of doing this? So there's a question on public spending, I can see. Um, again, uh, we've got to get the right market signals uh, in place. An example of a, a strong market signal um, comes from Berlin, actually, where they have, so the Federation of Berlin, they uh, have uh, procure, procurement guidelines where they say that only insulation materials that can be made available for reuse or recycling after deconstruction with a reasonable effort should be used. Uh, that's an example where uh, the public sector is trying to drive the, um, the, um, 
the uh, use of more circular uh, circular products. And, ex and an another example is in your homeland, uh, Jürgen, uh, in Norway, where uh, there are a number of municipalities pushing for waste-free construction sites, uh, which again means that uh, architects, developers, and so forth uh, need to think twice about what materials they're using in the building uh, to to ensure that they can fulfill that uh, those criteria. So a couple examples where the public sector can 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 drive this uh, uh, agenda, uh, so we can get more solutions in the market. Great, thank you. And and Jorgen, any comments to any of the questions from you? Uh, no, I, I copy paste Anthony on that one uh, in terms of the public sector, but you know, would also like to add that the private sector is equally doing the same thing. I mean, individually so, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the benefit of the public sector is that you can get some sort of directive and everybody has to uh, use it. But I think his, his point on, you know, the architects have to take a step back and start thinking, how do we design it? You know, if you think of the eco design mechanisms, you know, the looking from sort of the beginning to the end and then the beginning again. I think it's so important to invest uh, more time in that. And like Hüttel was an aluminum producer, we see that the greatest gains are frequently made when we can be part of, you know, the early phase process where you typically do sit down and say, for example, a building, look into the models, you know, the data models and see, you know, where is it beneficial to put aluminum in? And if we do it, how do we make sure that we construct it in a way that makes it easy to decommission? And it's notoriously difficult, you know, typically a building has a lifespan of I don't know, 30 to 50 years, right? But we still have to try. And not everything is as complicated as a building. No? So so again, being uh, mindful about the fact that you want it back, you want the loop, I'm pretty sure there is a lot of low-hanging fruits that can be, uh, can be picked, just starting to think a little bit more structured in the way you produce, assemble, and, and uh, discard uh, products. Up to and including, you know, maybe aluminum shouldn't be part of this process, steel is better there, aluminum is better there, et cetera, et cetera. But it needs, um, it needs a qualified and, and comprehensive discussion to get there. Yeah, for sure. Well, great, I'm, I'm seeing that we, I mean, we've got another question in that's quite knotty. Um, so um, I will just uh, move us on to final, uh, just some quick final reflections um, and want us to make sure that we end on time. Um, so, before I forget, thank you so much um, both to, to Jorgen and, and Anthony and of course Christina earlier on, um, as well as the wider team, um, so Martina and Diana in the background um, for this webinar. Thank you, you to attend for attending. Um, I think it, it, it's really valuable and it's great that we have this technology that we can do this. Just as a very quick final thought, um, my reflection is that um, for, for this wider move towards sustainability, climate, circular economy, um, I think just what we heard from the businesses of just it making economic viability, if we want to enable businesses to to, to, to support and, and lead on the change, um, we've got to create those conditions. Um, and I think rather than making it sort of government versus businesses versus consumers, you know, I think there's a lot of people really wanting to do things about climate and understanding the wider issues that we we face. Um, so I think it's just enabling the different parts of the of our society to be able to really capitalize from that. And hopefully today it's given some prompts of, you know, what different groups ourselves at CISL, government through the EU, but also businesses are doing in the face of this challenge and, and how we can take that forward and how for yourself you can reflect on that and in different ways of making change wherever you are. So thank you very much. Um, if I think my email address is here, but um, if you would like to reach out to us, um, feel free to. I put the links for our um, reports all in the chat, um, but if you didn't catch them, yeah, you can contact us, find us on LinkedIn. So great. And we are on at 12 o'clock, so uh, I will let everyone um, leave and continue their day. So really great. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Right. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.